in those early dialogues that we're still, for the moment, confining ourselves to, um, one thing that Socrates keeps saying is that he has no positive doctrines of his own to teach, that all he's doing is asking people questions. But there seems to be something disingenuous about this claim on Socrates' part. I think that, in fact, there are, so to speak, unacknowledged doctrines lying under the surface of these dialogues. Would you agree with that? Well, there are some doctrines that emerge, not very many. Um, there is a group of ideas which comes out in the Apology, for instance, when he says that to a good man no harm can come either during his life or after his death, and which comes out in the Gorgias when he argues at great length that injustice harms the doer and justice benefits the doer. It's the idea that there is no real harm that can come to you. You lose your money, stricken by, paralyzed by disease. None of that really counts as harm. Only the loss of your virtue would count it. Only going in for bad practices like injustice, they would be the only real harm, because the only real harm is harm to the soul. There's a group of ideas which he's, Socrates is very emphatic about, where he sometimes even claims to have knowledge, and it's also a group of ideas where Plato never reneges on Socrates. He remains convinced of the truth of the proposition that injustice harms the doer and justice benefits him. And that's provided your soul remains untouched, worldly misfortunes don't do you any harm of any really deep significance. That's right. Yeah. There's another group of ideas which Socrates, where Socrates does not claim knowledge and where Plato eventually is going to renege on Socrates, and that's the group of ideas summed up in the statement that virtue is knowledge. In these dialogues, when somebody's asked what's courage, what's friendship, what's justice, sooner or later as the discussion proceeds, the idea emerges that this virtue, courage or piety, should be regarded as a kind of knowledge. And that's just as strong and paradoxical a statement as the first group of ideas, because common sense, and I mean common sense then as now, ordinarily supposes that it's one thing to have the wisdom to know what the best thing to do in a given situation is, but another thing which you also need, the courage to carry it out if it's difficult, or the temperance to resist an easier option instead. Wisdom's one virtue, one quality to admire in a person, courage is another, and a man may have one and not the other, or each of them to different degrees. But if courage just is this knowledge, then that kind of contrast can't arise. If I don't do the right thing, it can't be that I knew what I should do, but lacked the courage to carry it out. I just, if I lacked the courage, I lacked the knowledge, and I didn't know what the right thing to do was. So any wrongdoing that I do is done in ignorance, because I didn't know it wasn't the best thing to do, and if done in ignorance, done involuntarily. So, no one does wrong willingly, is the famous way it's yeah. summed up. Doesn't the unvarying dialogue form that uh, Plato writes in give rise to two rather important and also really unnecessary problems? First, to what extent is this the historical Socrates whose views are being put before us? And to what extent is he a kind of fictional character created by Plato, because after all, all these dialogues were written after Socrates' death. And the other question, perhaps related to that, is what are the author's own views? Because again, since these are all dialogues, it means that all opinions are put into the mouth of other characters. And that sometimes, at least, leaves us feeling that we're not quite sure what Plato himself actually thinks. Well, I think there's a sense in which we need to worry about this question and a sense in which we don't. The sense in which we don't is that Plato's portrait of Socrates makes the claim, here is a man who thought for himself and would overthrow long-cherished conclusions if it turned out that he thought they were wrong, uh, and he taught others to do the same. So if Plato comes to think that there is more to virtue than knowledge, though knowledge remains the most important factor, 
and he does come to think this, then it's only in keeping with the Socratic spirit to throw over the doctrine that virtue is knowledge and produce a better view of his own. The other side of the coin is, of course, it's most important that we notice what's happening when Socrates in the Republic says something incompatible with what Socrates said in the Protagoras. Notice that we're getting a new view and how it connects with all the other concerns of the Republic, how it makes a much more complicated picture of moral education and how it makes possible a new vision of a political ideal society. The important thing is the search and the inquiry, but it's got to be inquiry, search, with understanding of where we've got to from where. Yes, in other words, because our assumptions and beliefs and so on are open to perpetual questioning, conclusions, in quotation marks, don't have any special status. They're, they are themselves staging posts on the road to further inquiries. That's, I think, what Plato believed very strongly. Yes. And, and so he's, in a way, demonstrating this to us by his practice. Exactly. And I think he would claim that that was what it was to keep the Socratic spirit alive. Yeah, perpetual questioning. Mm. It's usual, isn't it, to divide Plato's output into three periods. It happens so often with writers and even creative artists, the early, the middle, and the later. And so far in this discussion, we've been confining ourselves to consideration of the early dialogues. When you move to the middle period Plato dialogues, you find Plato for the first time beginning to put forward positive ideas of his own, not Socrates's, but Plato's own ideas, and to argue for those ideas. Which would you say are the most important of Plato's positive doctrines? I think one has to single out two above all, the theory of forms and the doctrine that learning is recollection, the idea that to learn something is to recover from within your mind recesses uh, knowledge that you had before you were born. Let me take that one first of the two. I think a lot of people will think when they first hear this that uh, we are born knowing things. That might sound a bit bizarre. But at least very closely related ideas to that have been permanent in our Western culture. I mean, idealist philosophers have thought that there was innate knowledge or innate ideas. Most of the religions, I think, believe something of the sort. And we even have eminent contemporary thinkers like Chomsky believing that you're born with a whole grammar programmed into your mind. Now, what was Plato's version of this belief? Plato's version was that this knowledge was part of the essential nature of the soul, which the soul possessed before you were born, because he believes at this period in the soul existing before it's embodied in this world. And I think to understand this theory, um, one's got to go back to those early Socratic discussions. Uh, if you look at one of these early discussions, somebody is asked for a definition of, let's say, courage, and Lakeys, who's the person who was asked that, says at one point, courage is endurance. Socrates then asks him some further questions, and he always does this when he's been given a definition, he says, is courage invariably a fine and admirable quality? Yes, says Lakeys. And then Socrates takes him through a number of examples of endurance, where endurance is not admirable at all, maybe very foolhardy, pig-headedness, pig or, or yeah. it may just be morally neutral, yes. as when a, some, a financer keeps on spending money, enduring the losses, because he knows he's going to get a profit at the end. So if endurance is morally neutral or bad, courage isn't, courage is always good, then courage can't be endurance. That's a typical pattern of Socratic discussion. Logically, all that's actually happened is Lakey's has been shown that his beliefs are inconsistent. If we take all the answers together, they can't all be right because they contradict each other. But Socrates always presents the situation as one in which that definition, courage is endurance, has been refuted. So that he is, in practice, taking Lakey's secondary answers as either true or somehow nearer the truth than the definition, and hence available as the basis for refuting the definition and saying that's the one that's got to go. Can I just uh, uh, stop you there? Because I think you've said something that's of great importance to us all today. I think we all tend to have this assumption that by discussion you can get at the truth. 
Whereas almost by definition, discussion can't necessarily do that. All it can sh the most it can show you is that your conclusions are consonant with your premises. But of course, if there's something wrong with the premises, then there'll be something wrong with the conclusions. Yeah.